Hi everyone, I am Matteo Lugli and today I'll present you our work on fermionic state discrimination through local resources. First of all, I am a PhD student at the University of Pavia and I'm currently working in a quit group with Paolo Perinotti and Alessandro Tosin. So we start from the task of state discrimination, which has already been deeply investigated in the quantum realm. Let's see the most general setup. We have a black box, namely an unknown device, that prepares system Q in either the states rho or sigma with prior probabilities p and q. We further assume that the states are pure. We'd like to carry out some measurements on the system to discriminate the two original states. The task of state discrimination is fundamental throughout the information theory. Let's assume, for instance, that we'd like to save the simplest piece of information ever that is a bit, so 0 or 1, on a memory. To read that information back, we need to discriminate the two states the memory system is in. As a consequence, memories do have to be able to discriminate between 0 and 1, so to discriminate between two states. For quantum systems, we, um, we have three possible protocols for state discrimination. The first one is perfect discrimination, when we require the protocol to distinguish between the two states with no error. We know that it is possible if and only if the two states are orthogonal. If we, if we release such a constraint, such a strong constraint, we must take account of some kind of error. So we have two strategies. Conclusive discrimination is a binary discrimination with two results that we describe with P of M, so two positive operators that sum to the identity by sigma and by rho, and the error probability is then that of measuring sigma when the state was rho and measuring rho when the state was sigma. The third strategy is uh, unambiguous discrimination, which we require to be flawless, but we must make allowance for a third inconclusive result, which we uh, describe it by question mark. So the error probability is then that of measuring that third inconclusive result. So let's continue with a simple example. If we have uh, two orthogonal states, we measure in the same basis. But we may wonder what happens if the two states are uh, describe a system that is bipartite, so it's divided into two subsystems. In that case, our setup slightly changes. We have uh, two subsystems, one is A, which is given to Alice, and the other one is P, is given to Bob. And then we consider that state, the, that new state, where the two um, vectors are entangled. We know that we can disc uh, discriminate between the two systems through local operation only. How we do it? With uh, such a description in a new basis, which is the basis of plus and minus, so 0 plus 1 and 0 minus 1, and if Alice measures on her own system in the basis plus or minus, and then sends the result to Bob, the result is either plus or minus. So it's a bit and can be sent through a classical channel. Then Bob's measuring that same basis. They can discriminate, distinguish the two systems, since, for example, if Alice measures minus and then Bob uh, measures plus, we have that minus plus belongs only to the phi state, so the state was actually phi. So we have perfect discrimination through local operation. We can generalize such a setup with uh, the class of local operation and classical communication. We have, uh, the, uh, we have a, a state of a bipartite system. The wall here describes the two subsystems being far away distant being uh, isolated, so Alice uh, applies, carry out some uh, transformation or measurements on her own subsystem, then sends to, uh, to Bob the result, which uh, is uh, um, through a classical channel, depicted here with the telegraph. Then Bob can uh, apply some measurements or transformation on his own system after knowing the result of Alice. This is LOCC1. We, uh, so we make allowance for only one round of, classic, of communication through classical channels. 
then we have all classes of LOCC up to the um, proper LOCC class where we have an unbounded number of rounds of communication rounds. For quantum state discrimination, we know that all three uh, classes, so it has been proved that all protocols are ideally implementable both through LOCC. That means, so in particular, so for conclusive and ambiguous discrimination, we have that the LOCC protocols attain the same, so the optimal protocols, LOCC protocols attain the same performance as the unconstrained counterparts. But things are different for fermionic system. Oh, we strongly believe that fermionic theory is the most fundamental theory in physics. So, uh, the fermionic theory has relevant results everywhere in physics, from solid state up to high energy physics. It deals with local fermionic modes, which can be either empty or excited. Uh, we have to say that if we consider only one fermionic mode isolated from any other system, it does behave only as a bit. It is a bit, actually. But if we uh, gather them together, uh, they behave different from it. So they behave as a fermionic uh, system. To describe that interactions, we introduced a fermionic algebra. So we have a fermionic operator for each mode, and they have two. Uh, satisfy the canonical anti-commutation anti relation. From that relation we derive the usual properties such as uh, the number operator, Fox state, Fox space, uh, that we are all acquainted with. But why do we say fermionic quantum theory? What does the fermionic quantum theory different? Uh, why it is, it is different from the quantum theory? Uh, the main difference here is the notion of locality. Uh, here we have a uh, depiction of, uh, we depict our uh, protocols with wires that represent systems and boxes that are the transformation. Let's take, for example, the transformation K that applies on, K on uh, system C. It is said to be local if the Krauss operator are generated from the fermionic operator acting on the modes of system C. So, if K and L are both local, they do commute. And we see it here, for example, for these two examples of uh, transformation, K and L, each is uh, local B and C, that if, uh, since we apply the, the Krauss operator and then the fermionic operator in pair, the minus sign that we would get from the uh, anti-commutation relation goes away. And that's because we apply the, uh, the operator in pay. A consequence of such an hypothesis, so of such a, a notion of locality, is the parity superselection rule, which is quite simple to say in the fermionic quantum theory. Uh, two states, two uh, pure states, cannot be uh, currently superimposed, cannot be added if they have different parity. With parity, we mean that the sum of excitation is an even or odd number, but they are uh, allowed if they are both, for example, as here, even. Uh, before we continue, we have to briefly introduce the jordan wigner transformation. We may be tempted to use the sigma plus and sigma minus matrices operator as uh, instead of the um, psi diagram psi uh, fermionic operator, since they do anti-commute on the same side, by the, but they commute on different sides. So, through the jordan wigner transformation, that is a, a star algebra isomorphism, we map the fermionic operators to operators on qubits by applying some sigma z, so sigma uh, x, y and z are the, uh, uh, the Pauli matrices, so that we can uh, take care of any other, um, uh, uh, we can accordingly take care of the uh, signs to attain the uh, canonical anti-commutation uh, relation. Through the jordan wigner transformation we have this relevant result that fermionic LOCC correspond to quantum LOCC over qubits. So um, we can take advantage of the notation of the usual notation and tools of uh, 
quantum theory of qubits we are all well acquainted with, but we must pay attention since the Jordan beginner transformation does not guarantee neither the super uh, the party super selection rule nor so that the transformation states are allowed in the, uh, the fermionic theory nor the uh, the transformation being local so local quantum transformation are not always mapped to local uh, fermionic ones so we can go now uh, on with the uh, discrimination state discrimination of fermionic systems we have here that Alice and Bob share a bipartite system AB in either the two pure states uh, rho and sigma as before but now they are uh, states of fermionic systems we promptly observe that we perfectly discriminate through LOCC two states if they belong, if they exhibit different parity. So, for example, psi is even and phi is odd. How do we do that? Alice just has to measure in her, uh, her own uh, system, subsystem, the, just has to measure the parity of her own subsystem send the result to Bob, so again it is even or odd, so it's a bit, it can be sent through a local through a classical channel, and then Bob does the same on his own subsystem. If the uh, parities are the same, both even and both odd, the original state was even, so here psi, otherwise it was phi. So we can discriminate, uh, if they, you can perfectly discriminate uh, through LSOC2 states that has different parity so we can uh, focus only on discriminate states that has the same parity and we know that um, states uh, we can all uh, we can implement through LOCC the transformation of flipping the parity by just uh, sw uh, swapping zero with one on each uh, sub on each mode so we focus only on states uh, being even and we can consider again the example as before, uh, the example of before, and we see that uh, we cannot apply the same strategy as in the quantum theory since the two states plus and minus are not allowed here due to the uh, parity supersection rule. Here is the main example. We actually show that it is not possible to discriminate through LOCC such type, such kind of uh, states. To see the rigorous result, we have to introduce first uh, the E and O part of two of uh, fermionic states. Indeed, if we assume that psi and phi are both even, we may uh, describe it. We know that we can describe it as a sum of states that we call the E part, where the, uh, that states exhibit even parity on both Alice and Bob subsystems. And the O part is the uh, state that exhibit the same parity, so uh, both odd parity for, uh, for both Alice and Bob subsystems. If we evaluate the scalar product between the two states, we see that if they are orthogonal, we are not, uh, it's no, we do not know uh, that it does not imply that the two uh, E and dot part are uh, orthogonal separately. With this definition, we can introduce the following theorem uh, for the orthogonal case. So the two states here are uh, orthogonal, and we say that the two uh, that the following statements are equivalent. The two states are perfectly discriminant through LCC, and the E and dot parts are separately orthogonal. By a technical, uh, from a technical point of view, we prove that for the SEP class, which is the class of separable state, the separable effect, which here show the same performance. Uh, separable effects are different from LCC. It's a different class of effects, but are far uh, easier to handle since they are defined as the sum, uh, as sum of uh, tensor product of uh, local effects. If we now release the orthogonality constraint, we come to conclusive discrimination. We followed here the same strategy as in the quantum one, which was uh, provided by Elstrom, where we uh, introduce a delta operator, which is the difference, of, uh, the difference between the two states, 
we diagonalize that delta operator and we have lambda plus and lambda minus eigenvalues and eigenvectors, we measure in the basis of uh, delta plus and uh, lambda plus and lambda minus. We know that they, in general, they are not separable, but they are orthogonal. So we have a criterion to uh, detect if it is possible to discriminate through LOCC. Indeed, we prove that the two states can be uh, optimally discriminate through uh, LOCC. So the LOCC protocol attain the same performance as the unconstrained un one if and only if delta commutes with the projector PE, so the projector onto the E part of the, uh, of the E sector of the uh, fermionic states. So if they do commute, if and only if they commute, we can attain the same performance. The third uh, strategy we've seen, which is an ambiguous case, uh, we, we see here on, only an overview of that case, to which we uh, dedicated a, a, a paper. And in that case, we have that uh, the condition is indeed that uh, the, error, the measurements are flawless. So we have uh, the probability of measuring phi when the status actually psi is uh, zero, and the same applies vice versa for the psi and phi case. Uh, the probability of success is that uh, 1 minus uh, that of measuring uh, the, uh, the third and conclusive case. So we show that the best performance in the uh, discrimination of fermionic states, uh, and the biggest discrimination of fermionic states, can be obtained by a protocol that first projects on the E and dot parts, so E and dot subspaces, only then unambiguously discriminate between the two post-selected states. So, uh, with such a result, we then compare the success probability of the uh, LOCC protocols with, that un with the unconstrained ones to get the rigorous criteria. Further information can be found in the reference. So, the take-home message here is that fermionic state discrimination through LOCC is harder than in the quantum one. But we show that we can overcome such a limit through ancilla-assisted discrimination. In uh, such a, um, uh, a protocol, we provide Alice and Bob with a further uh, system, a uh, uh, bipartite system, the simplest one, which is made of one fermionic mode uh, we, we actually two fermionic modes that are uh, divided to uh, one is given to Alice, the other one is given to Bob. So we show that it is always possible to discriminate between any pair of fermionic states through ancilla system discrimination if and only if the ancilla is prepared into the states into the maximally entangled state as depicted here where phi is an angle. In that case, we are able to uh, discriminate any pair, so we overcome any limits of the fermionic theory. So, thank you for your attention. For any questions or comments, please write me to uh, my email. Here are the references of uh, the talk. Thank you very much.